Funding for the Hinckley Report is made possible in part by the George S. and Dolores Dore Eccles Foundation and the Cleone Peterson Eccles Endowment Fund. Tonight on the Hinckley Report, ballot initiatives defined the 2018 election and had major impacts on Utahns. Why were so many of these citizen-driven issues successful? How did the legislature change the new laws? What was the response from voters? And what issues could we see on the ballot in 2020? In 2019, the Utah's legislature made major changes to the state's initiative process. How will this impact signature gathering? Does it open or close the door for future efforts? What is in store for the initiative process in Utah? And how will voters respond? Good evening, and welcome to The Hinckley Report. I'm Jason Perry, director of the Hinckley Institute of Politics. Covering the week, we have Steve Handy, Republican member of the Utah House of Representatives, Mara Carabello, president of the Exoro Group, and Rich McKeon, chairman of Levitt Partners. So glad to have you all here with us today on a very special edition of The Hinckley Report. Happy to be here. Uh, we're gonna talk about initiatives, propositions, what happened through the 2016 election, and what's happening now, okay? Is, we're gonna talk about a couple of them specifically. Mara, but we're gonna start about the high level okay. on initiatives, propositions. You worked on one in particular that we'll get into here, okay. and a couple of you have, Rich, and as, as a legislator, uh, Representative Handy even worked on this one as well. I want to talk about where you see propositions now, all right? We had a, a little bit of time. Are, are, are they still a mechanism that voters feel like they can use to move the needle on an issue in the state? So uh, ballot measures in Utah are considered some of the hardest in the United States. Wyoming arguably has a harder law. And after this wave of initiatives this last time, um, up from my seat, you also saw the legislature making some attempts to perhaps make it more onerous, if not more complicated. Some of it were acts of clarification. So the, it, it involved all of it. But from um, my seat, it, it was just um, another step in the direction of being really hard to to get on the ballot in Utah mm -hmm. as, an, as an initiative. It, it seems to me that that the fact that the legislature was willing to change, that it, one of them was renegotiated before it got there, that one of the initiatives to count my vote was actually removed by the ballot from from what was thought to be an impossible removal process, but, but marijuana almost got removed. I, I think there, there'll be a chilling effect. I think with the legislative changes and with the impact of what has occurred as a consequence of initiatives, that, that there will be second thoughts about doing these again. So some of the people that were engaged in them before might not try that now? I think looking at the landscape, it's, it has become harder not maybe legislatively, but in other ways, because uh, the legislature was willing to change. Let, you, me, you, let me maybe speak yeah, to I, the zeitgeist of that too. <clears throat> so 2018, we saw some of the highest voter turnouts that Utah has ever seen. And I think a, in some pretty ob objective analysis, one could say that that turnout was about issues it was about the ballot measures we energized a ton of utahns we as a collective energized a lot of utahns utahns were into these issues they were into addressing those you have to ask yourself what happened to the response that the legislature had about that citizen engagement and what did that mean and did that turn off voters who really participated at a high degree attributed to these ballot measures. So they were into it. The voters got engaged and that is the holy grail of democracy is engaging the electorate. Go ahead, Representative Well, I want, to, I want to disagree a little bit with Rich. I mean, I think that uh, we're in a whole new er era here. There, we, we are learning things about 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 citizens initiatives and i think we will see more of them i think that uh, what we did in the in the 2019 session that's just concluded w there have been some adjustments and some will will say oh you've made it more difficult to, to to do it but i think it's more of a management tool and i learned so much about initiatives that i think and w as a legislator we've each one of us has had tremendous pushback from constituents about this issue of the will of the people you violated the will of the people but i see an initiative is a, or, or initiative more like a, um, uh, it, it's more of a resolution. The people have said, this is what we want. We want medical cannabis. And the legislature then is tasked with, how do we implement it? 
Mm -hmm. So, Mara, talk about, let's get to this proposition, too, since we're talking about medical marijuana for a second. So, this is the issue. U <coughs> yeah. Utahns, by and large, say they support medic medicinal marijuana to mm -hmm. some extent, right? So, uh, some efforts went, became almost immediate uh, to try to adjust what happened with that. At what point is the initiative <coughs> trying to inform the legislature about what they want, as opposed to trying to take it, this is what we want, not necessarily what anyone else wants for us. So I, one of the things that happens in coalitions around initiatives is that these coalitions have different interests, right? Yeah. So I think there's always an interest of speaking truth to power, perhaps. And there's always an interest in making your own. A, a marijuana in Utah, in many ways, I thought was successful. One was that the legislature began to discuss with the initiative supporters changing it right away. That's correct. And, and I think that is a marked difference in the marijuana discussion, in that the discussion happened during the initiative process, during the vote process, and then continued to resolve itself in the legislature. Mm -hmm. So if you go, look, we saw a laboratory for political scientists in this mm -hmm. session. We had an initiative that went through almost unscathed redistricting. We had one that was negotiated before a session. We had one that was was altered. And I think because the people and the legislature are co-equals during the session, we had one removed and we had one turned into a question. Right. And if you want just a potpourri of opportunity to discuss it. We had initiatives that were primarily funded by people out of state. We had initiatives that were primarily funded by people in state. We had initiatives that were passed predominantly in Salt Lake County and not in other districts. We had some that were, that would, uh, in, in, I think uh, the account I vote, I think would have been statewide. But, but so there's just so much interest in terms of the different configurations that present themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, Representative Handy, yes. on, on, on medical marijuana, this one was a little different in that it didn't wait for a session. Yeah. necessarily uh, the legislature started to get involved in the negotiation up front how I guess compared to some of these other ones how helpful was that to just get engaged immediately as opposed to convening as a you know during the legislative session and then make tweaks well as you recall the implementation for prop 2 was December 1st and so the legislature met on December 3rd but but there were all these negotiations as Mara has indicated going on previous to that and we were in a, a caucus where uh, Connor Boyack and DJ Shantz came and said hey they agreed with the new bill the bill that was coming out from the legislature they they because they they saw the problems with with Prop 2 in terms of its, you know, there were so many unintended consequences. So in, in when, with former Speaker Hughes, you know, I mean, this guy, uh, you know, ha, the way he worked through this with these with these people, it was it was really terrific. But but so we did it on December 3rd implementation. Medical cannabis in Utah is now legal. So it's now we're in implementing. Maybe expanding that discussion a little. Yeah. Here's what I didn't like about what happened with Prop 2 as it related to the other propositions. Prop 2, medical marijuana, new law in the United States. And so drafting those bills are complicated. Very tough. Um, so I think it was fair to say that Prop 2's drafting, I think proponents, opponents, the mm -hmm. drafting of medical marijuana, complex. Yeah. The legislature then began to use this notion as a predicate that somehow there's a flaw in the drafting of all initiatives. And they use that as often the pinhole. So Prop 3, they came in and said for Medicaid expansion, well, I mean, these amateurs have been drafting this, and so therefore we need to just make it up to professional standards. That was an entire misnomer of Prop 3 and a tactic, a political tactic, mm. to in my view, to reverse the will of the Prop 3 vote back to the will of the legislative vote because the outcome of Prop 3 mirrors pretty directly the legislation that the legislature passed before Prop 3. But they did use this disparagement of somehow that a proposition is lesser law. And as Rich pointed out, According to our Constitution and according to the mandates of the will of the people, the power of the people, it's not a lesser law. It's a co equal law. It is law. co equal. It, right. it, it's two paths to the system. So I do think the legislature uh, uh, this, does use that. This is, a, you know, Medicaid is perhaps the perfect storm. I mean, it is, if you ask people about compassion, and from the side of compassion, everybody wants everybody to have health care. Sure. But, but the, the flip side of that is cost. And uh, we've seen this play out in state after state, and that is the collision between access and cost. Right. And I think that's the issue that, was, that, that they wrestled with in the legislature and said, you know, you did provide for some cost, but not enough. And I, but, it, it, but it is really a perfect collision for people 
people to consider as as to the balancing of government and and the place the government yeah. should act, actively assert itself. I, I think we need to explore two, two of these very big issues that come forward. And, and Representative Hannity, let's talk about the first one sure. uh, that Mara brought up, and then let's get to the money side. All right. So uh, these initiatives that go forward are drafted by not legislators often. Sometimes they get involved in some of these, but not usually. All right. So what is the perception of the legislature on some of those when you talk to your colleagues? Because you know Medicaid expansion is a little different than the drafting of the medical marijuana. Right. Right. right? So what is the perception there uh, when the language comes that maybe wasn't drafted in a forum that often our laws come in? What, what do your colleagues say? Well, I think the perception is is that, you know, the, 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 I mean, we are not a democracy. It's a representative republic. And so people elect me to, to go and make the very best decision I can. If they don't like what I've said or the decisions that I've made, guess what? Every two years, you know, they can, they can throw me out. So when you go through the process, I mean, let's go back to medical cannabis. I, my, I'm remembering this now. That proposition was going to just wipe out all these unintended consequences, all these I impacts in the code that were never intended. So let's go to the medical, medical, mer medical, uh, uh, or uh, Medicaid expansion. Uh, much more difficult, much more, uh, much more, uh, uh, you know, robust in terms of his, if its discussion. You take a, somebody like Representative Jim Dunnigan, the expert on this, and you you talk to him about it, and most of us can't understand it very well. So you have to kind of trust that it's gone through the proper vetting process, that the attorneys, the analysts have looked at it to look at the unintended consequences and the consequences to make sure that it's going to mm -hmm. line up correctly. Mm -hmm. So, so Rich, Rich let's, let's discuss your point, too. So the legislature is looking at this proposition this past, and there are certain certain costs. At what point do you feel like the legislature has to kind of give way to the will of you know, the people as, as they voted on this when there are economic realities, Listen, at well, least in, in their perception yeah. of what the re economic realities are? Well, the reality is, is that we, I think, pride ourselves in a legislature that is financially and fiscally conservative and balanced. And they and, and it is the predominant uh, underlying force of what they do. And I think it, it contributes to the economy that we have here. Uh, I uh, but but this is an issue that has played out at the national level and at the state level. I mean, we are we we have a, this wonderful compassion, and our compassion is to extend Social Security benefits, and right. it manifests itself in Medicare and in Medicaid. And frankly, in, when they initiated these, they, they thought that Medicare would be about an 11 billion dollar uh, item by by the mid 90s. And the fact of the matter is, they were only off by a couple hundred billion dollars. And, <laughs> but let's and, talk about the facts in Utah. The yeah. facts in Utah that there was no disagreement that you could implement Prop 3 in its entirety. There were no disagreement about how well drafted Prop 3 was. There was a dis an ideological disagreement, as you're suggesting. And then the ideological disagreement is, of course, fair. But there was no need but for wanting to overturn the ballot measure to not implement it this year. No one disagreed that the fiscal catch-up was in two to three cycles. Right. So three years, it, is right. often, it is often held on legislation mm -hmm. that you implement and then you Mo and, and then you advise, right? Yeah. You, you That is a routine That's construct exactly, of, exactly. Of, of our legislature. Sound law, not sure of long-term outcome, implement tweak. Tweak every mm -hmm. year, tweak every year. That's why you don't bind law. So why then would you not apply that to the will of the people less if you didn't like the mechanism? So I'm going to defer to the representative because I'm not trying to defend this as much as I am to create the collision that I think exists okay. on a regular basis. Yeah. I guess I would just say that, you know, yeah, the, 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 the people voted for, for medical uh, or for expansion Medicaid, but it was not sustainable based upon the little bit of additional mm -hmm. uh, tax income. And Mara is right. It would have taken some time. I frankly was in favor. I, I would have been fine with implement it now, see what we learn, tweak it change it, fix it, change it as we go as we go forward. But I think that she is on to something, the, the fact that, you know, no, we you know, and this is a tough thing to say here. We kind of maybe think we do know better 
uh, about the way that this is going to work. And also, the thing we haven't talked about is the issue of the waivers. Mm -hmm. if, if we don't get the federal waivers, wow. Which no one in the United Which, States has it, ever received. That's, I agree waiver. with you. I agree with you, Mara. Wow. <clears throat> but, but those are the details of the initiative. Yeah, yeah. I think looking at it, one has <clears throat> to still go back to the question you asked, is the disposition of a lay legislature. Because one of the discussions that's interesting about this is Utah prides itself on having a, le a lay legislature. Mm -hmm. We pride ourselves on not having professional politicians, but rather normal, Citizen. in quotations, normal citizens, um, <laughs> Citizen it, 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 having the decisions. So there's a little bit of hypocrisy from some of them <clears throat> to claim an inordinate amount of, of superiority in policy when it comes to reviewing and looking at ballot measures that are brought forth. Okay, yeah. go ahead, Rich. No, I'm I'm just enjoying the conversation. <laughs> okay. right, very good. Well, well, tell us about the internal workings, if you if you can, Representative Handy. So let's take Medicaid expansion, which was which Mara had a hand in helping to draft. So. Um, there, there are financial implications. There's the waiver issue come forward. Uh, where is the balance do you see with your colleagues where you say, we do respect the will of the people, but there are realities that, that the legislature thinks that they have that they need to accommodate now? I mean, what, what is the flavor right now with the legislature on those, knowing we maybe get more in the future? Well, I think that I think that there will be uh, I think that there will be political fallout from uh, in some of these swing districts, particularly in Salt Lake County and maybe who knows where else for because the legislature stepped into this and the, about this kind of a fundamental misunderstanding of what the role of the legislature is and what the role of the of the people is. And maybe the legislature, I'm going to say this, maybe the, on, 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 on Medicaid, maybe we should have put the pause button on and just waited. You know, we took a lot of heat over medical cannabis uh, and just waited a little bit and, and, and see where we go with the thing. So uh, we're in a whole new whole new era here, a new world. We're just learning as we go along here. So I heard one of the things that I, I that I heard, and I'd be curious about yeah. this too, and that is that that representative stepped up and said, look, this was a this was predominantly passed in the Salt Lake Valley right. and my rep my district did not say this. And I'd be curious about the reaction that that had because I think in representing their districts they felt they were being true to the true true to form yeah. there. That was a big deal. That was a big deal that people would say, Steve, did you did it pass here? Did it passed there and we were given statistics to determine whether it did pass in our legislative districts in our counties mm -hmm. and so forth and so on but a lot so rich is right a lot really bought into that I frankly never did. I thought it passed, it passed, it's the will of the people. And for those who let's, buy into let's, that, let's what I it. love is to yeah. extract it. So, oh, yeah. they must look at their precincts in their district and decide who to represent more in their precincts in their district based on how their vote count. That's not the way <laughs> elections and representational <laughs> democracy goes. I, I agree with you. A win is a win. A win is a if win. If you're going to decide to only represent right. people in, in your area, then I want you to look at your electorate and, Steve, you decide that you're only representing right. the people right. north of. Of Main Street. Right. Well, it's an interesting point, because, Representative Andy, because you're looking out for your constituents. Sure. But you look at medical marijuana. It, these are the most populated areas, of course, but only eight counties. It passed in eight counties of 29 in the state of Utah. It's close on these other areas, but that's essentially that's where the population is. But if, if you're a legislator, you're looking at one of these initiatives going forward, which passed by a majority, but maybe not yours, if you're in rural Utah where it doesn't pass, I mean, how do you approach that analysis? Well, I think, again, we're in a, we're in a, we're in a time here where we're learning about this. That was a narrative uh, that was that was brought forward again that, hey, it didn't pass and didn't pass in Washington County. I don't have to. I'm not bound to do this. I didn't buy that. I felt like, no, it passed in the state. We it, it passed. And so we have to figure out uh, mm -hmm. now what to do with it. Okay. How far do we go in the adjustments and what will the political fallout be yeah, because yeah. of that? But how can that not be just seen as a justification? So when the governor yeah. gets elected and <clears throat> loses San Pete County, does the governor then not have to adhere right. to the wishes of San Pete County? But that's, he, but that's he doesn't not have true. to be elected only in San Pete exactly. County. Exactly, he has to. Right. He or and she interestingly has to. enough, right. he doesn't have to have a distribution of 26 uh, of right. 29 Senate districts. Yeah, he doesn't right. have to go gather 10 percent, 8 percent of signatures <laughs> exactly. before he runs. Gotcha. He's gotcha. got the easiest path to the election that you can true. find. Yeah. So Very good true. on him. Okay, so Rich, you brought up a couple of interesting points about how these various propositions were treated d during the kind of the interim and during the session. You know, uh, medical marijuana, they got after pretty quickly. Uh, uh, the Medicaid expansion we got during the session. You were working on one that sort of got negotiated beyond all of that. Talk about the strategy on the count my vote with the SB 54, and if that is a good way of, of getting 
an idea forward even without legislation. So, SB, we, let's to call this what it is. So, Count My Vote has always been about voter participation. And we concluded in the 214 session that we would negotiate a resolution to create a dual path. Instead mm -hmm. of having just caucus convention, we would add to that mm -hmm. signatures and allow both of those to go forward. And, uh, and, and I think it's been a benefit. And I think we've seen the benefit in other places. But uh, some changes to the law occurred with the court that we thought necessitated changing the threshold, making it a bit easier to get on the, uh, on, on the signature path. And, and what we've... And what we've had is it's really been interesting because an active small sliver of a small group who are active and organized and well-funded have been after this very since the very beginning. And they filed litigation. We've gone all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. That wasn't satisfactory to, to conclude the discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been uh, legislation passed in just this last legislative session that begins to erode the dual path because it eliminates the dual path from special elections. And th then you saw what happened to the GOP uh, on the weekend when they met with the Central Committee, and they reduced significantly the number of votes it would take to remove the chair of the party. And, um, and I think this constant erosion has created some real foment, some real difficulties and sociologic issues that have not been resolved. And I don't know that they're going to be resolved as long as there is this sense among a small group that the only way to elect people is through caucus yeah. convention. Yeah, that's right. I think that's right. That's very interesting. But in terms of the negotiation, I'm, I'm just curious too, because sometimes, uh, you know, in the legislature say sometimes the best bills are the ones that make something happen, even if the bill dies, yeah. right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, and yours is one of those things where the negotiation, I mean, did you learn a lesson that maybe it is good to negotiate that or considering you had to stay involved ever since then? Well, that we thought that we had resolved this in a very, very meaningful way and that we'd come to an elegant compromise. And Kurt Brand was the one that stepped forward and said, look, your, your, your initiative eliminates the caucus. I think it st should still be there. He gets castigated in a, in a bucket that he doesn't belong to be and it deserve to be in because he really tried to preserve the caucus convention system and did. And, right. and frankly, I think it's a pretty elegant system. I think people like to be informed by the convention, but I think they want to vote. And the John Curtis election is, is, is evidence that that's the way that it expresses itself. The convention says 11 percent, but he wins overwhelmingly in the election. And, uh, and, and I think that's what we've, we've ended up with. And the negotiation was was an important part of that. It eliminated our need to proceed to get signatures. Mm -hmm. It eliminated our need to to run a campaign and be elected. It eliminated the need of the legislature to subsequently look at it and say, can we do better with this? Okay. I want to sp spend the last couple of minutes here talking about changes this session on the process itself. And just get your feedback. And one of them you, you sponsored, Representative Handy. Let's talk with House Bill 133, which passed that would make it so initiatives don't go into effect until the next legislative session. Mara, <coughs> good, good thought or not? You know, I think it's a, the, the, it's a power move. It says, let us look at your work first, and then we'll see how it goes. So on one hand, I nod to say they can. So if I'm being slightly cheeky and, and slightly in favor of <laughs> initiatives, I would just point out that the prevailing law is the prevailing law, and if I were to draft an initiative, I would prevail that law. So I would also point out that the initiative could prevail that law. Yeah. Uh -huh. So <laughs> an, ar an, argument, an argument for or against, Rich? I, I, I think it's almost irrelevant because, they have, because they're co-equal. They have the opportunity to do it any time at any session or a special session if they thought it uh -huh. necessary. So they so could have done at any point anyway. I agree with that. I think so. Okay. When you talk about you, some of your changes, Representative. Yes. I have. A, I had a bill that came, came about, uh, was passed, uh, initiated at 195, and it had came about because I started asking questions of my clerk in Davis County. How's this going to work? And uh, like I said before, we're in a whole new era here. And so that kind of morphed into a discussion with the elections office, and it was kind of like, well, what, what changes would you like to see? So in my bill that passed with hardly any any uh, negative votes, we move the we go to what's called an active voter. From the presidential voter is the basis, and the and the and the elections people say this gives us a better metric on this. It gives us a better measurement that we can measure an active voter as opposed to one who's voted uh, voted every four years. In, in your mind, an active voter is what? Someone or who votes more frequently and that uh, at least within two year cycle. 
Okay. And it, it's defined in code, actually. The other thing it does is it takes then, so so now you go to an 8% of the 26 of the 29 Senate districts, and it's uh, the calculation right now, it's 115,000 names, but that's going to be able, that's going to be changing from yeah. 113 right now to 115, so a couple thousand different. Huh. And, and on, when, when, so I think um, Representative Handy's bill, uh, I, I think most of us, the analysis that it's probably a wash in terms of the process, number, and, yeah. and that I, I like the deference to the clerk. I don't know if, if all of us realize that really the keeper of the initiative, the keeper of much of the election law, and particularly the enacting of election mm -hmm. law, is the local county clerk. Yeah. So there's some heft there with some of these that we'll talk about a little later. One area um, that I hope uh, uh, Representative Handy maybe relooks at as we play, as, as we go through a cycle, is this question about can you bring up a topic more um, than yeah. once? Yes. Yeah. And I um, think that citizens and legislators should bring up topics that they're concerned about as often as they are concerned about them. And so I hope we have a reconsideration of how often we could bring forth a topic. I'd echo that. And I'd say, you know, generally, I think that even those of us who have been involved in initiatives would recognize that it's onerous to get one on. But it, but it probably is appropriate to be a bit onerous. You don't want to have this so easy that the entire budget is consumed by initiatives. Mm -hmm. uh, and they can be. So I, I'm and not in opposition and to I'm that. And I'm going to just echo that because I think it is so important that everyone hears. I mean, I, I, I've, I've likely been involved in more ballot measures than, than anyone in Utah, and I have never heard anyone suggest that they want more. There isn't a group of people who want to legislate by ballot initiative. That is not something That's that right. exists. It's too hard to do. So in refining and in speaking truths to different organizations, I think we shouldn't lay down that, that ballot measures are something people seek as a first course. It's just not. Uh, oh, I, I agree with that. Absolutely agree with okay. that. Okay. Thank you so much for your insights on this. It's so great to have a broad perspective uh, on this particular issue, particularly when it comes to the will of the people. Thank you very much for this. The Hinckley Report is now available as a podcast. If you would like to listen to the discussion at your convenience, please go to your favorite podcast platform and subscribe. Thank you for being with us. Good night.